Hi, folks. This is Harold Ree with the Paw Print Animal Rescue Podcast. We're giving away a free copy of Forces of Nature, the book by Graham Spence featuring Joanne Green, today's guest, as well as Penny Cons. How do you win this free copy? Sign up for our email list. This is pawprint.com slash ask. That's A-S-K. You sign up for our email list whenever you receive the email, which is about once a week. Simply open it up and that's your ticket to play. You might win a great book like Forces of Nature or some other cool prizes. Once again, go to thisispawprint.com slash ask. Thanks and on to the show. This is Paw Print, an animal rescue community, episode 124. I'm Nancy Ree. And I'm Harold Ree. Today's talented guest is Joanne Green. There was a phone number on the dog's tag. We called and the woman had the sense to leave a message saying, I am no longer at this number. Please page me at the Houston Astrodome. And we did. We're so pleased to have Joanne Green as our guest today. She is one of the subjects of the book, Forces of Nature by Graham Spence. If you remember Hurricane Katrina from many years ago, not only did it have a huge impact on a lot of people in the Louisiana and Mississippi area, it impacted a huge number of animals. Joanne Green happened to watch the footage on Katrina on her TV, and she decided to do something about it. If you want to learn more about Forces of Nature, the book by Graham Spence, and see some amazing photos by Joanne Green, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 124. That's the number 124. When we were out in the field rescuing, there were murmurs between the rescuers saying, oh my gosh, we should write a book about this. Some of the uh, rescues were very exciting and very colorful and others were very sad. It's just all about the cottage industry of disaster rescue. And as people talked about it, Penny and I put it together and we wrote it. Hurricane Katrina, it happened over 10 years ago. How do you remember all the details? I had saved my paperwork when we went out on a daily basis. We had a list of homes that we had to visit. And so I had made notes because when you come back in at the end of the evening, you matched your notes against and entered them into the computer so that the um, overall uh, effort was moving forward. To me, it was just a matter of going through the notes. But for Penny, it was very interesting that she had vivid recollections of her saves and of her misses. So when you uh, talk about saves and misses, can you can you explain that in a little bit more detail? Yes. Sometimes the saves were successful. Um, we were able to... Um, find the animal in good shape, everything was good, and then we'd bring it back and go through the procedure of tagging it and keep it within the system so that the um, owners could eventually find it. However, the misses were very sad. It was um, the end of August, beginning of September. It was 100% humidity. There were no city services. There was no air conditioning, no water, no anything. And the supplies that were left weren't enough because people didn't know that they weren't coming home in a day or two or three. And also that they were uh, shut into a house with the windows closed. And there, there was nothing. There was no air. There was, they just, it was hot. Just rewind a little bit. Could you maybe explain to folks, why did Hurricane Katrina become such a disaster, not just for humans, but for all these different animals? For me, as we saw the footage come out of New Orleans, when people were beg- begging to be rescued and to be helped, they're, they stayed with their animals. They were part of the family. And that made it all very real to the nation. I mean, think about it. Would you leave your pet? Probably yeah. not. It, it, yeah. it would have to be a, a real disaster. Absolutely. And with that, the film crews captured it. And all of a sudden, it became a, a thing, a thing throughout the nation and the world and people who had been rescuing all the time beforehand finally got some uh, validation th- that that this is this is important and other people stepped in to help. It was a very exciting turning point within rescue. 
you're not a Louisiana native. Where were you when you first started witnessing all these all these television reports? I was in Chicago at the time. So it was a matter of how do you get to the area? So um, I put my thinking cap on. There were rumors running around that HSUS was accepting applications and would provide you a safe haven to, to headquarter out of. And I applied and I was accepted and drove from here to Baton Rouge. HSUS uh, US being Humane Society of the United States, correct? Correct. They, they um, uh, took, took over uh, for the sake of streamlining this partic- in particular uh, disaster. What what was going through your mind that got you inspired to to drive yourself down to Louisiana? I saw people making life and death decisions for themselves. And as they did that, that I could see the passion in their eyes, the sadness, the emotions that went through as they left their pet behind. And as we are all pet lovers, we know what the next step is. So we knew we had to help. So you get to Louisiana. It's still a disaster zone, right? I mean, there's still massive flooding. When I arrived, we were all headquartered out of a fairground called Lamar Dixon in Baton Rouge. In the morning, we were paired up in teams. You never went alone. And uh, let me go back a second. Lamar Dixon was a military post at that point. National Guard was there. We were all under military uh, role. We were in the gates by nightfall or there was a time, I don't recall that. And if you arrived a minute late, you had to sleep on the outside of the gates. There were meals inside. Um, Military had their own meal. Pet rescuers had their own. We had air conditioned tents. I wasn't fortunate enough to to get one. Uh, There were cots in there. And and with that, every morning we gathered up by a um, headquarter for the animal rescue people called the Prowler. And it was a um, a mobile home type of deal. And we get our assignments, we get our partner. And the city map of New Orleans was divided into sections. And within that section, you got a a list of homes to go to. And you had to work it quickly and make sure you got there throughout the day. If you were two or three short by the time you needed to leave in order to make come back onto Lamar Dixon before nightfall, those two or three animals that, that were left behind that you didn't get to may, may very well perish. So we worked it as hard as we could, and it wasn't always possible. There were no street signs up, no, no, there was military throughout New Orleans, there was, um, no lights, no nothing. If you got a flat tire because of pieces of uh, building that you were rolling over, that was it. You were done. It, it, that was it. it. You just had to stop the list. So when we'd come back, at least I did, if I didn't catch those last two or three, there were two or three or four stellar teams that I'd wait for them to go in to town early, like a two or three in the morning. And part of those uh, people were um, the city of Newark. They sent down their uh, their team and I'd hand off who I didn't get to, to those people. And they took off besides theirs. They had mine and whoever else caught on to this as well. So I felt that I had covered everybody, but still tried my darndest every single day to take care of um, all, all the animals. In the book, you actually had, there was actually one pretty dramatic time when you actually had to miss the, you actually missed the curfew. And as you said, you had to sleep in your car uh, outside the gates, right? Yes. Not only that, they were beagles. I mean, they were beagles. They weren't just sleeping. They were very busy in my car while I was trying to sleep. And not only that, um, being so close to oil and gas, when New Orleans flooded and the water receded, there was oil and gas everywhere. I mean, there was no fresh water in ponds or, or the Gulf or anything. So these animals, as well as most of the homes in, in and everything in low-lying areas, were covered with this slime. So these slimy little beagles were running all over me. Kiss me, kiss me, play, play, play. And it's like three in the morning and I had a full day ahead of me. So it it was um, bittersweet to say the least, but we did get the entire family reunited and back with um, their owners. Right. It was a family of five beagles, correct? 
Yes, it was. Yes, yeah. it was. And we have pictures of them in the book. <laughs> right. My daily log probably had 20, 22, maybe 25 uh, homes that I had to stop at every single day. When I went through, once again, when the water receded, you're going into a home um, that's probably locked. So you have to break in. So you had to spend time locating it. You had to spend time breaking in. You had to spend time going through the house. Oftentimes, in fact, more, more times than not, in the low-lying areas, the, when the water receded, the cupboards and the closets in the rooms, doors and, and windows were uh, muddied shut. So I had to spend time making sure that a cat wasn't caught in underneath the, the kitchen sink or at the top of the linen closet. And I went through everything to make sure. And then in addition, besides that, because the water rises so quickly in New Orleans, it's customary to keep an ax in your attic. So if you continue to go up as it floods and it reaches the point to which you have to go beyond your roof, you have to have an axe up there. So we saw plenty of axes and that's where we also looked if we could not find the animal that we were looking for to see if he had passed away up on the highest point. It, it must have been rewarding work, but I mean, when, you know, when you see all the suffering, it must have been just, uh, it must have been really tough. It was. I remember meeting at the prowler in the morning and some volunteers had called it a day, handed in their credentials and just walked away. They, they, they couldn't do it anymore. I just felt that if I didn't do it, there was no one else. No one else would help. No one else would help. So I knew I had to go on. It's no worse than as us rescuers know that you see on the streets of a major city when you rescue somebody, but it's just, it was the mass. It was the sheer mass. And it was, it was the volume of everything around it was in the same chaotic state. Trees were overturned, water lines. I mean, you can go down the street and you saw see water lines up to the very top of the house. It, it was, and with that came lawn chairs and furnitures. And, uh, and when you got in, the mold was going up the drywall and everything that was a poster was, was lost. It, it was, it was something I truly hadn't ever seen. We're talking to Joanne Green, one of the main subjects, along with uh, Penny Kahn's of the book Forces of Nature. How many days and weeks did you end up spending down in Louisiana? I was there about three weeks. Penny was there over a month. And then because the job wasn't done, we went back several times. Um, so we were probably in uh, New Orleans for probably 18 months thereafter, on and off. Yeah. People did stay. People that we volunteered with, we saw on our second, third, and fourth trip. Unbelievable stuff. We filled Lamar Dixon time after time after time. And because there were no more cages, they moved out to the next city. Houston took uh, a lot of animals. Florida did. Here in Chicago, we took animals. And then you no know, sooner would everybody take them, then the cages would fill up again and they'd go again. And the cages were set up. Lamar Dixon is a, um, there was a, uh, a uh, horse, ho horse exhibition, livestock, and each stall, they'd stack three, four cages of cats all the way around the perimeter of the stall and possibly some in the center so that each stall probably handled, I don't know, maybe 60 animals. Okay. And there were, there were, I wouldn't say hundred stalls, but maybe. And then the dogs were less crowded because the dogs were um, more um, uh, uncomfortable. Cats adjusted quicker. And then there was a reptile uh, location. There was livestock. And actually, when we were out, um, I, I found a alligator who needed some help. Mm. How long before the waters receded enough that, 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 that you didn't have to use a boat to, to, to get around? I arrived as the waters were were receding. So we can get through on cars. Penny was there earlier than myself and she was going through on boats. 
doing the best she could. Um, you just, you were told, you were given a punch list by HS US what to bring. And a lot of them were high waders and boots and what have you. Um, so that uh, we, we can do what we want, needed to. And in addition, when the waters receded, because it was 100% humidity, it was often just mud. So you were literally um, uh, taking time to slosh through on what would have been a walk from the car over to the um, the house that you were about to uh, enter. What was the state of these cats and dogs as you're finding them? They were not good. We took who we could. And if we took them, we knew that because it was so hot, you couldn't put them in the car to secure them as you went on your next um, address on your list, unless you left the air conditioning on. And if you left the air conditioning on, there's always the chance that the car would have been, um, you know, taken, stolen, whatever, by somebody you just don't see, you know, as you enter the street. Um, or you run out of gas, and gas was very precious. It was a commodity as groceries and water that wasn't plentiful. So that was the opportunity. And then at some point we caught on that there was somebody down uh, in um, Delgado, uh, down by the college that was taking in animals. So instead of catching one or two animals and running back to Baton Rouge and coming back, which is a three or four hour um, project and losing the majority of your day, you can drop them off if there was room to the people at Delgado and they would bring them back up to Lamar Dixon for you. So that was very helpful. When we saw animals and couldn't get to them, we had big uh, aluminum lasagna pans and we carried food and water with us and we set up hundreds, if not a thousand feeding stations throughout Southern Louisiana. And what we did is we slit, we found a safe place, slid open a bag of dog or cat food, opened it up so that the, uh, the animals can come in the middle of the night and take what they wanted out, out of the bag and also that it would last longer. And on the lasagna, lasagna pans, we filled them with fresh gallons of water that we carried in our uh, cars. And then we made note of the feeding station, and that's part of the information that went back on a day, nightly basis to Lamar Dixon. When you say um, some of these dogs and cats, you, you you couldn't reach them physically, but but yet yet you were able to to, to uh, feed them and 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 give them some water. Uh, what would be the circumstances where you couldn't reach them? Frightened. We've all seen them. A dog who you've seen darting in and out of traffic, you pull your car over and you try to get them and they're too frightened and they keep on running. Or somebody that was a true stray. Um, cats that were hiding, waiting for, for their family. We just we couldn't get them all, but we, we did our best to keep them alive. How many of the, the actual human families were you able to actually meet? I'd say, let's see, there was a little puppy. I met his mom. Uh, cats, maybe, maybe about a half a dozen, maybe 10, 10 people. That's a lot. Um, and it took them and they were scattered just like the animals. They were scattered all over the nation. So you, when you were in somebody's home, you had to look for a cell phone bill or, um, a, a, a neighbor that stayed behind who had a number in order to reach people. They were in motels and in Tulsa in uh, Alabama, in, um, geez, uh, upstate New York, uh, where people, they were bussed everywhere and there was nothing to come home to. I luckily found everybody. There, there was one home in particular, uh, I think it was Garden District, slightly low land, um, a handicapped woman. She evacuated on time and she left her parakeets and her little puppy behind. She did the best she could uh, with leaving water and food and newspapers on the kitchen floor. And the um, parakeets didn't make it, but the dog did. There was a phone number on the dog's tag and we called and the woman had the the sense to leave a message saying, um, I am no longer at this number. Please page me at the Houston Astrodome. And we did. Wow. And we let her know her puppy was alive. 
That's unbelievable yeah. right there. Yeah. And actually I visited with her for probably a year, a year and a half afterwards. And then uh, we lost touch. I also remember another um, instance uh, behind the hospital, Tulane's hospital. They had left and they had left their three cats behind. We broke in and she, had, once again, another bright woman. She had filled her bathtub filled with water. So there was enough water for, this is probably three three weeks out now, these people are gone. Um, and there, there wasn't much food left. I went uh, flipping through um, their um, paperwork and I found relatives. The relatives connected me to them in a motel in Alabama. And um, I, I, the woman was, was just ecstatic that her three cats were alive, um, thanks to her, actually, and that uh, she was worried about the food. I said, don't worry, don't worry. Um, they're okay. I did, of course, leave them food, but they had survived on the roaches that had come up uh, with the water as well. So between the roaches and what food was left in the water, they did fine. And we were able to um, secure them and move them on to a relative to take them to the, to the uh, owners in Alabama. Animals, when given a chance, can figure out a way to survive, right? Uh, absolutely. What you end up learning about yourself? Wow. I, I learned I had... Uh, better self-esteem coming out of the project than going in. I enjoyed the respect of people who always had looked sideways at people who rescue. And I, I think we all know what we're talking about. People um, who criticize you. Oh, you have uh, two dogs. What's wrong with you? Oh, you have uh, four cats. What's wrong with you? And you see comedians make jokes about it and what have you. But I truly made a difference. And cared less about what those people said. Why do you do what you do? You stunned me. I, you actually stunned me. As a small child, anybody who rescues, you will hear as a small child, they knew th that uh, they were comfortable with pets, with animals, more, more so uh, th than other aspects of life. And so I look at it that if I didn't do it, nobody else would. But there was, there was, a, comfort, there was a relationship. Uh, beforehand that, that I knew, knew I, I love pets. Well, we're talking to Joanne Green, as you can tell, a real animal rescue hero. Drove from Chicago to Louisiana to help out with Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the victims of Hurricane Katrina, or really more specifically, the animal victims of, uh, of Hurricane Katrina. When you think of any particular animal that inspired you during that time, what would that animal be? Or who would that animal be? I would have to say the animals who were on the street, um, either they were originally street animals or they were animals um, that uh, the um, military came in because they did door-to-door -door checks. And when they opened a door, oftentimes an animal would run out. They, they were inspirational to me because they survived and they continued to survive on the street. Once we hit our lists, we were allowed to bring in animals off the streets, and those were the ones who had it the hardest, and they did the best. Knowing what you know now, if you had a magic wand and could change something about animal rescue, what do you think that would be? I think the industry has already done it. The disaster created contingency plans. The city gets together now and they um, make arrangements, drop off your pet here, evacuate there. Everybody's tagged, everybody's numbered, everybody, everybody is done in an orderly fashion now in the disaster zone. But once you leave disaster zone and say you go to a shelter, the American Red Cross is famous for excluding animals. People lost their lives at Katrina because they stayed with their animal because they could not evacuate to a shelter with that pet. 
I'd like to change the American Red Cross to accept pets. That's important to know, right? Um, it is, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, people people uh, saying that I'm wrong, but I saw it. In fact, there was a recent article um, in, I think, the Washington Post from uh, Matthew, how many more animals uh, were saved during Hurricane Matthew because um, uh, some shelters accepted the animals. Why did you take 10 years to to tell your story, or at least to tell your story in book form? That was because of me. I didn't know how to do it. We looked, we searched, um, we approached book writing companies. Um, uh, it, it just wasn't working for a myriad of reasons. But lo and behold, Penny has a uh, job at a um, teaching hospital, uh, a, a hospital in, in Detroit, and they have lab animals that she goes in and she feeds. And uh, there's a uh, person who comes in and volunteers and reads to the lab animals besides her taking care of them. And Penny would listen to the story, and this, there was this fabulous story being told about saving elephants in Africa. And simultaneously, I had just seen on the Today Show um, military telling uh, their story of saving the animals in Baghdad at the zoo as uh, during the war. Turns out when we both compared our notes, it was the same author that the lab volunteer was reading from, as well as wrote the book about the military, and that was Graham Spence. Graham's military book is the uh, Babylon Ark, telling the story of saving the animals, and I believe it was the elephant whisperer that the uh, lab volunteer was reading from and we contacted him and found that he was open to the idea well sure enough Harold he comes from London he currently lives in London now he comes uh, to meet me in Chicago and together we all go down to uh, New Orleans and we walk those sheets that I told you about the addresses, we were able to show him the proximity of the levee breaking and the path that, that the water uh, took and what it wiped out. We were able to show him rebuilt houses and the pictures of the houses where the water lines were. It was fascinating to him, and I think that he told our story well. We we just didn't know how until we met him. And once we met him, it was a matter of months. We got it taken care of. When was the last time you were you were in, in Louisiana? I would say probably last Memorial Day. Okay. Not, not this, yeah. And so we, we go back. We still have friends. There are people who still rescue down there. Um, people in a million years who, who, who weren't. I didn't know them before, and I, I cross paths with them down there, and they go from feeding station to feeding station. They take their own money or whatever they can raise through donations at, you know, the bin and PetSmart or Pet Supplies Plus or what have you, and they do spay and neuter, and they cut down on the colonies and take care of the uh, city's animals. It's nothing that they wanted to do. It just, like me, they fell into it. How do folks find uh, Forces of Nature? It's at www.forcesofnaturebook.com. And there it gives a brief synopsis and some information on Graham and Penny and myself and the ability to buy. And we're also located on Amazon. As we wrap up, I mean, really, the floor is yours. Anything else that you'd like to share? Every day is a rescue day for me and other people who, who are like-minded. If you see a stray in the neighborhood, um, uh, don't ignore them. Leave a bowl of water, a little bit of kibble. Notify somebody who, who can help you. Um, if you're... Um, you have a couple extra dollars donated to the local shelter, it truly does help them. Um, as as we've discussed, it's not... not there's no extra money. Everything goes to veterinarian care or food for the animals. And then just always keep them in mind. Without you, they, they won't survive. They need your help. We want to say thank you to Joanne Green for sharing her story. If you want to learn more about Joanne and Forces of Nature, the book by Graham Spence, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 124. If you'd like to listen to more episodes of Paw Print, 
You can find us on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes, SoundCloud, and Podcast Addict. Search for Paw Print Animal Rescue and make sure to hit the subscribe button to get the latest episodes immediately. Don't forget we're giving away a copy of Forces of Nature. All you have to do is sign up for our email list. This is pawprint.com slash ask. And when you receive our emails that come out about once a week, open up the email and that's your ticket to play. We just want to say thank you for all of your support. We've been listened to in over 120 different countries and territories, and we couldn't have done it without your help. So thank you. And remember, you spread a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone, and see you next time on Paw Print. Print is a production of EVER Education. You can't handle the truth.